Speak to my heart. Speak to my Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Welcome to Sabbath School. At this time, we'll begin with prayer and a song. Uh, let, us, let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, you have commanded your people to make a sanctuary so that you could dwell in our midst. Lord, we have come into this place to dwell in your midst today. We ask that you will come and abide with us, tabernacle here with us. May your Holy Spirit be seen and felt in this place. We ask, O oh Lord, that as we prepare to uh, discuss the Sabbath school lesson of this week, may your Holy Spirit be the chief presider in our midst to teach us what we do not know. May your spirit of truth lead this discussion so that we'll be able to better understand the truth, the present truth for our times, and equip us so that we can become your faithful witnesses for you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Grant unto us the blessings we stand in need of. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'll uh, sing song number 384. Song number 384, Safely Through another week. Safely through another week, God has brought us on our way. Let us now a blessing sing, waiting in his courts to Supplies of grace through the dear Redeemer's name. Show thy reconciling face, take away our sins and shame. From our worldly care set free, may we rest this day in thee. From our worldly care set free. The morning is our rise. May we feel thy presence there. May thy glory meet our eyes when we in thy 
thy house appear. They will fall us, Lord, at days of our everlasting peace. They will fall us, Lord, at days of our everlasting peace. May the gospel joyful sound come Christina's comfort says May the fruits of grace abound Bring relief to all complaints Thus may all our Sabbaths be Till we rise to reign with thee Thus may all our Sabbaths be Till we rise to reign with thee. Thank you very much. At this time, um, this week we have studied the um, uh, lesson uh, relating to the uh, spread of the gospel during the uh, early church, uh, shortly after Christ's ascension. And um, as I studied this week, I couldn't help but notice one specific phrase that spoke to me, and that is authentic Christianity. And um, this authentic Christianity was seen or was made evident throughout the book of Acts, where the believers had one common interest at that time, to simply strengthen the community of believers and, of course, spread the gospel at all cost. Stephen was willing to do that at all cost. Paul himself was willing to do that at all cost. And even for those who had means, they were willing to invest to provide the support that the brethren needed so that they too could spread the word at all cost. That is authentic Christianity. And this week's lesson, uh, as we have a, a panel that will uh, come to us and share with us some of the insights, uh, deeper insights that the lesson brings uh, to us this week. And uh, Elder Kinsey uh, will come to us now and introduce her panel. And uh, I will also take my place on the panel. How is everyone this morning? Amen. The pollen is so thick outside, I'm not even seeing well with my reading glasses today. <laughs> I tell you. This has been interesting to me. Um, the title of our lesson study for this week, can get to it. The Central Issue, Love or Selfishness. The central issue, love or selfishness. And I'm going to let the panel members tell us what lesson studies they have and then give the name if someone doesn't know them. Good morning, all. This is, uh, my name is Ulrich Gill, and uh, I would be doing Monday and Wednesday lesson today. Amen. <laughs> Okay, I'm Carlton Forbes. Good morning, everyone. I will be sharing um, some tidbits on our lesson, our Tuesday's lesson, April 9th. Amen. And Thursday. And Thursday. <laughs> and Thursday. Okay. Our lesson study starts out with our memory text this morning, and it is Isaiah 41.10, and they're using the New King James Version. 
And it reads, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And when I first read that, the, uh, the memory verse, and I began to look at the lesson study, I was like, okay, I'm sure that plays in there. But then as I began to study more, I began to understand that without God telling us not to be afraid and not to be dismayed, the things that are going to come upon us, we would be very, very very fearful and I'm just so thankful that we serve a God that he warns us and not only that he is with us in our struggle so I want you to do something with me today and I know it's early this is my best time of the morning even though I don't like early does that make sense <laughs> I think better in the morning but I don't like to be up in the morning I like afternoon okay but anyway think with me for a moment Suppose you are a herdsman tending your goats on the Mount of Olives. It's in the lesson study. And you're overlooking Jerusalem and you are working with your cattle and you are trying to get them fed and then you hear voices in the distance. And you lean in and you want to hear what is being said and then you recognize the voice. Just imagine with me, it's the voice of Jesus. Can you hear him? He speaks clearly and without doubt. Give him your full attention as he speaks to the disciples. The disciples are admiring the temple in Jerusalem. And I read in the uh, message paraphrase the scripture where Jesus said, so you like the glamour and the size of the temple? And they're like, look, look, it's so beautiful. And he tells them, assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Can you imagine the confusion they're looking at this beautiful temple. Imagine with me, they're looking at this beautiful edifice. And then Jesus says, hold on for a second. You might think it's beautiful, but not one stone will remain in a little while. Amen. And I can imagine that they were a bit confused. Is he talking about now? Is he talking about later? Is he talking about day after tomorrow? What is he talking about? And Jesus begins to speak to them. He's speaking of the age of the disciples, and this is the power of Jesus. Not only is he speaking of their day, but he's speaking of our day. Because when I began to look at this lesson, it shook me. Because we are living in a time now where, okay, when, I, when my phone goes off in the morning, I look at my phone, it appears to be bad news. If I flip on the TV and I think I'm looking at the weather, yeah, it might be weather, it might be bad weather, and then it could be bad news. When I step outside and, uh, of my house or either I talk to, especially Sean, when I talk to Sean, Sean is telling me something that's online and it's bad news. It's something everywhere you go. I'm sure you remember not too long ago, a few days ago, a Richter scale earthquake hit Taiwan and they said it's the highest ever, 7.4. Okay? And then a few days later, you hear the news. What happens in New York? Earthquake. 4.8. And then they said that the aftermath of that was about as heavy as the earthquake. And then you keep listening, and then if you're inside your house on the other day and you saw all or you heard all of the wind blowing, and I got home, and we, we take extra care with our garbage because we don't like for it to go everywhere, and I got pulled up and everything was laying out, out and there I was in all of that storm trying to pick up stuff and pull it together, and I, I can imagine people laughing at me in my neighborhood. But anyway, I'm just everywhere you go, and I just hear the word of God speaking to us in now from then. Rumors of wars, wars, rumors of wars. We hear all of this stuff. Every time you turn around, there's so much confusion. And when we had a certain individual in, in, as leader of the United States, I said to my family, I said, he is a master at keeping us off focus. Yes. 
Because if it's over here, you can imagine that if the trouble is over here, that there's something behind the scene going on. And this is what the Lord is telling us. We need to be vigilant. We need to be wise. And I know we're on time, and I told them I wouldn't talk much. We need to be vigilant, and we need to be, be mindful and sober and aware of everything that's going on around us. But I'm so thankful that we don't have to do it alone. We serve a God that is with us in the midst of our struggles. And Mark Finley puts it like this. He, Jesus, speaks of false Christs and false prophets international conflicts, global natural disasters, rising crime and violence. He speaks of all of this stuff. He said, and then Matthew 24, Jesus sums it up. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, and then shall the end come. And then in Sunday's lesson, it speaks of a broken-hearted Jesus. And this kind of, I felt this a different way this time because I really un began to understand that the tears and the brokenheartedness of Jesus was not for his impending struggle. It wasn't for that. Somebody tell me what his tears were for. Anybody? Do we have to have a microphone? We do have to have a microphone. Go around. Do I need to have it? Somebody help us. Anybody going to help us? We going to help ourselves then. Anybody want to answer? If we don't have, okay, here, Pat. It's really a stretch of the world. Up to this time, people did not realize the love of God. But Jesus came to share with us his tremendous love, and he knew he was going to be rejected. He was the only hope that they had, and yet he was rejected. How many of us would do it anyway if we knew we were going to be rejected? No matter what the thing is, would you do it anyway? It's easy to say it, but when rubber meets the road, would we do it? Anybody? Okay. Uh, Sister Tito, I just want to add that uh, the tears that Jesus shed wasn't just for that time. He looked down through the ages and he see, saw the destruction of the world. So, and he shed tears. So, we must know that uh, Jesus cared for us even from since then. He know what's going to happen. And he shed tears because he see that this world is going to be destroyed. And so many people are going to be lost. Amen. And I'm going to end up with a writing from Ellen White. And she reads, she captures the emotions of a broken-hearted Savior. Jesus did everything. Everything that he could do to win the hearts of the people, but they chose not to receive him. Mm -hmm. I was, when you were talking, Pat, I was thinking about that song. I said, why don't Pat sing that song, The Love of God? That would be so beautiful. And it reads like this. The majesty of heaven in tears. The son of the infinite God troubled in spirit, bowed down with anguish. The scene filled all heaven with wonder. That scene reveals to us the exceeding sinfulness of sin. It shows how hard a task it is, even for infinite power to save the guilty from the consequences of transgressing the law of God. Jesus, looking down at the last generation, saw the world involved in a deception similar to that which caused the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus was looking past Calvary, past Golgotha, past the garden. He looked past and he sees us where we are today. The pain in Jesus' heart was not only for the coming destruction of Jerusalem. Looking down through the ages, he saw the sin in every generation. The Savior beheld the be rebellion of humanity in every age. He saw the rejection of his love and grace by those he came to save from the very first century to the end of time, and his heart was broken. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Teacher. Uh, looking today at Monday's lesson, Christians providentially preserve. We have seen 
throughout the word of God, he has given us promises. And the reason why he did this, because he knows that we're going to be faced with situations that we're going to be looking to, or to someone or to, for something to hold on to. So God has given us, and I, I uh, want somebody in the audience to find uh, Isaiah 41, 10. One of the promises that, uh, you know, a lot of us look to. Uh, but I'm going to read Psalms 46, 1. And this is, it says that God is our refuge and strength, our, our very present help in trouble. Don't mind we might not, you know, uh, see him, but we must know that God is our refuge and strength. And we can always turn to him at any time, we in any situation. Don't let the devil tell you that, oh, this is a small, insignificant thing. You don't need to take it to God. But brethren, let me tell you, God cares about every little thing about us. Amen. Every little thing. So we can take anything to him. He hears and he answers. Amen? Amen. Somebody could read Psalm, uh, Isaiah 4, the 110 for me. Yes, go ahead, Sister Lisa. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not uh -huh. be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. Amen. And, and this wasn't just directed to uh, Jacob, uh, Isaac, and them, Abraham, and them. It's also for us, right? And uh, we must know that we are going to face situations in this life. And as I said earlier, that Jesus looked down and he, he shed tears because he knew, he knew that many wouldn't receive him, wouldn't accept him, right? And he, he, he shed tears because they wouldn't understand what he went through, right? Had gone through for every man, even before they were born. Jesus suffered so that we can have eternal life. So if they would only understand and grasp what he did and turn their lives to him, it would be a good thing. But the lesson said that God is sovereign and overrules events on earth for the ultimate accomplishment of his divine purposes. Now, we must know that God has a divine purpose to be fulfilled in this earth. And he would use any and everything for this to be accomplished. Even if his faithful stewards <clears throat> do not want to do it, God would use people that he would raise up to do this work so that his work would accomplish. Amen? It says, although at times God alters his original plans based on our human choices, his ultimate plan for this planet will be fulfilled. And, and when you really think about this little speck of art that God cares so much for, it makes you wonder and love him so much. As I told you a couple of weeks ago, this is the reason I love God so much. You know, because when he gave me that revelation of what Jesus went through on the cross, I said, how could I, a sinful human being who did, did so many bad things, and God could want to use me to help bring others to his knowledge of uh, uh, saving grace. I thank him so much. So it says there will be times when the people of God experience hardship, persecution, imprisonment, and death itself for the cause of Christ. But even in the most challenging of times, with Satan's most vicious attacks, God sustains and preserves his church. So God says... The gates of hell shall what? Not prevail against his church. So don't matter what. We have ourselves have seen it here at East Market Street. We have gone through so much. And God has done so much for us. You know. And that is why we must love him. And serve him with all our heart. Amen. Uh, I just want to share these two texts. In uh, Hebrews 11, 35 to 38. And Revelation 2, 10. Could somebody read Revelation 2, 10 for me? I want you all to be a part of this. And I would find Hebrews 11, 35 to 38. 
If you have Revelation 2.10, read it, please. Now, wait for the mic, please. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Uh -huh. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison right. that you may be tested, and you will have tribulations ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Amen. Amen. Who, who don't want to be, have the crown of life? Huh? This is why we must be faithful to death. Amen. Hebrews 11, 20, 35 to 38 says that women received their dead raised to life again and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had a had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in, in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Amen? Brethren, some of us might not have to go through that. God knows who could suffer what, and he would not allow you to suffer what you can't handle. Amen? If you're going to suffer, you must know that God prepared you to suffer. He put what you need inside of you for you to suffer. So don't let us, uh, you know, be afraid that if we live until the persecution time come, that we would not be able to suffer. God would make sure that we are ready to suffer. Amen? So this ends the, the, the Monday's lesson about Christians providentially preserve. Amen? Uh, at the bottom, I just want to share this. In vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the church of Christ by violence. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when these faithful standard bearers fell at their post. But by defeat they conquered, God's workmen were slain, but his work went silently forward. So God's work will go on until all is accomplished. Amen. Uh, oh, I have a, a thought over there. Go ahead, Elder John. Yes, good morning, happy Sabbath. I, I was just um, reflecting on that lesson in particular about um, Christians being providentially preserved by God. And that is uh, reflecting back on the whole Jerusalem situation and when Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, is that God did give a warning yes. that it's going to happen. That's right. And he said, when you see certain things, for example, uh, Jerusalem being surrounded, know that its destruction is about to take right. place. And so history tells us that Christians, not one Christian died Amen. in Jerusalem because they heeded the warning of God. They were faithful right. to his word and they escaped when they saw the abomination of desolation as it's called. And so God has been given us warning after warning hence the church's message the three angels message the warning that his coming is soon and we are to be ready we are to be prepared but I just wanted to highlight that that God took care of the Christians back in Jerusalem he will take care of us today also Amen. but right. also just wanted to um, emphasize something that you mentioned and that is about um, each of us individually not having to fear but the question often comes up, how is it that the good will suffer and be killed and the wicked are prospering? And, and it's easier said than done that, yes, God will keep me and God will preserve me. But it just shows that each of us have to be wrapped up and tied up in the Lord that regardless if I die, Regardless if he didn't choose to heal me from the cancer or from the sickness or, or, or there was an accident and my child died or my wife died, we have to trust God that he knows That's right. what is best. Amen. You know, and, and so we, 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 
Because we can waver in our faith when serious things happen to us or our family members. Yes. And we can come to that point of questioning God. But we have to be resolved to know that whatever comes our way, That's right. God is still in charge. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for that talk. Uh, somebody has took Sister uh, Cornelius have a talk too. And I'm reading from um, um, the E.G. White notes of the Sabbath school, and this is coming from Monday's lesson. That's and it so says, nice. to all the faithful ones who are striving against evil, John heard the promise made. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess him before my father and before his angels. This time that we're living in, we see there is wars all the way started. And like he, um, Brother John, I think is his name, mentioned early, the signs are out. If we are paying attention and if we have not got ourselves ready, the time is now because we don't know whether we're going to be sealed. We don't know whether we're going to die. We don't know. But you have to make sure that you have lived the best life you can. And the pen of inspiration said, when, when um, light has shown for you to do the right thing, you must do the right thing. And righteous, righteous, um, living, um, righteousness is living righteous. Amen. So you have to do that. Because the end is coming, whether we play church or not. The end is coming. Amen. Thank, thank you so much for those comments. I'll now uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Smith to do Tuesday's lesson, Faithful and Amid Persecution. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Gill. Faithful Amid Persecution. So I'm glad Elder John brought up unwavering faith. I'm glad that the two panelists before me gave us a little walk through history because those are the two things that I focused on for this lesson. And I don't know if you all have heard me say it, you probably have, but I love to start at the end of a story, especially a story that doesn't have great points along the way. And from this word here, persecution, that's not a nice, happy thing, right? So let's start at the end. Let, in reviewing pastor's sermon from last Sabbath, I was looking at the Beatitudes. You know, he said the attitudes to be, where God said, where Jesus says, blessed are the meek, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the merciful. But the last blessed are, it says, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, for Jesus' sake. Then he says, not just be faithful, but he says what? Rejoice, I say, and be exceeding glad. And why did he say that? Because he says, for great is your reward. For so persecuted they the prophets before you. So that's the end. And let's now look at, so with that in mind, we can have unwavering faith. We can have that joy. We can rejoice even amidst that, that persecution. So I can imagine that throughout the first few centuries, say um, from the mid-first century all the way to um, the mid-fourth century. So almost 250 years is what history recalls as the great era of persecution of the Christians. I can imagine that people who sat and listen, listen to the Beatitudes, listen to Christ, brought that up in their memories when they were being persecuted. They brought up Christ's words saying, rejoice and be exceeding glad for so persecuted they, the prophets before you. And I can imagine them telling it to their children and their grandchildren. So even around um, the mid 300s when uh, the persecution peaked and started to wane, I guess, people still had Christ's words in their, ringing in their hearts and their minds. So that's how we stay faithful amid persecution. Go back to the word. 
Christ has promised us that we can rejoice because there's a greater reward for us. So that's the faith part. Let's look at the history part. So past, present, future. All three of those eras will have, have had, do have, and will have persecution, right? So the past, as I mentioned, 250 years from, say, AD 60 to 310, the Christians were persecuted in Rome. There are times when if you were part of this, that new sect, sometimes they just called it the superstition as a sect, but the Christians, the early Christians, you could be exiled if you were lucky, or you could be beheaded. Well, you've heard, we've all heard of all the, the things that used to happen to Christians, right? And um, just ideas about them being fed to wild beasts, ideas about them being sawn in two, being crucified upside down, being lots of different types of persecution. So not just persecution as in get out of our province, we don't want you here, but actually being killed. So then Tuesday's lesson is saying, even throughout these early centuries of Christianity, when the Christian, the Christian church grew rapidly, despite all this persecution. What types of persecution? Imprisonment. Any of us ever been imprisoned for the cause of Christ? Torture, physical torture, and persecution. Faithful believers, totally committed to Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, proclaimed his word with power. Lives were changed and tens of thousands were converted. And then we go on, the lesson goes on to tell us about Acts 2, verse 41. So that's the, um, I'm sure you all read these verses in your weekly study. So let me just remind you, Acts 2, 41 talks about the 3,000 who were baptized, added day, that one day to the church. Acts 4, verse 4 mentions an even bigger number of 5,000, not 5,000 total, but it says 5,000 men. So you can, you know, um, go from that and realize that there were more people if you count the women and even children. Then Acts 5, verse 42, and this is all talking about what's going on during the persecution. Acts 5, verse 42 says that despite this, the Christians were daily in the temple and the house, and they taught and preached Christ. So even with people at their doors threatening to burst in and to get rid of them, they were daily being about God's business, daily showing up to the church, daily preaching, and not just preaching, but teaching so that their ranks could grow even more. We even think of people like Achilla and Priscilla who themselves were exiled from, they had to leave Rome because of their, their beliefs. So there's a question, and I want somebody to just chime in and answer. It says, what do these verses, these verses I just mentioned, teach us about the challenges the New Testament church faced, and more importantly, why it grew so quickly? So despite all this persecution and challenges, what is the major theme throughout all these verses that's mentioned as to why you think the church still grew so rapidly? Anyone? Any kind of comment you have is welcome. Uh, I would I'm, say that early, uh, during the early church, they had all things co in common. They really uh, gave their property to, uh, to, to spread the uh, their selfishness. They, everything they had, they gave it to the church. And uh, really, uh, they didn't have that uh, uh, Independence, like we are, we, they uh, share what, uh, things with others, and they had that love, that genuine love for one another. Amen. Yes. The church belongs to Christ, and it will forever exist, regardless of the consequences or the persecution. I think the goal is is um, salvation, everlasting life. I think that's the gift. Amen. Amen. And they were totally committed to God. Amen. 
um, in the face of trials and tribulations, we don't turn our back on God. We just know that he is always there and he's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. So we take those words and promises that he gives us to propel us to move forward. Amen. Amen. It also says in, the, in one of the notes that the blood of those slain were seeds for the gospel. Amen. Amen. Meaning where one died, others sprouted. Yes. So um, it's so important to go back to the word, to go back to all the promises Christ has given us. And I remember once somebody telling me that a lot, so many Christians today believe God, well, believe in God, but somehow we don't believe God, meaning every word that God says, we don't take it for ourselves and say, oh, that's for me. And that's why I'm dealing with the past, present, and future. So in the past, we have people, even, even um, Paul ended up being persecuted, right? After being the purveyor of so much of the persecution himself. And you can read that in Acts 8, verses 1 to 8, right there in the lesson. So the disciples faced threats, imprisonment, persecution, and death itself. And I remember a Bible verse where the, um, where the disciple is telling, is telling us, you have, not yet, you have not yet resisted unto death. So yes, times are hard, but the Bible verse says, you haven't even given your life for, for this thing yet. So we do have to keep that in perspective. There, is, there was a lot of physical persecution that where people lost their lives. The estimate is that if even 1% of the Christians at the height of the Christian experience in Rome were persecuted, that would still be 60 to 150,000 people who would have been persecuted daily and losing their lives over that, those 250 years. So past, so let me quickly jump to the present, is there persecution around us? Is there persecution of Adventists in our Christians in Greensboro? Is there persecution in North Carolina? In, in the United States? In North America? Let's, let's branch out now, North America. In the Euro-Asia division, that's the focus for this, for this um, quarter. So. Unfortunately, the farther we branch out, we're more and more the voices are saying, oh, yes, yes. So in China today, they actually block Christian websites. My cousin is in China. The Christian websites are, are blocked, are Christian apps. That's persecution. It's not the persecution to death for the early Christian church, but, and sometimes it is. Sometimes they do have raids where people die. In India, there are a lot of attacks by other religious groups on Christians. They wait till they meet, they attack. There are a lot of Islamic attacks in Africa. Across a, a wide area of Africa, Christians are attacked. Their eyes are gouged out. They're basically what you thought had finished in the early um, Christian prosecution. And even now in South America, Central America, drug cartels will target Christians as well, Christian preachers, and try to extort them. So this isn't a past situation. It's present. Maybe we aren't tasting it right now, but definitely we then can switch to the future where we have been told that perilous times will come. And we just have to go back to the lesson Go back to the end of the story where God says rejoice and be exceeding glad. And also go back to the lesson and remember we have to be faithful amid persecution. Amen. So I might not ask you to chime in, but I just want to leave you with the thought. What can we learn from the early church that can help us, the end time church? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, I'm going to continue what Dr. Smith was saying with Wednesday's lesson, Caring for the Community. And the lesson starts with a profound statement here, the first two lines of Wednesday's lesson. It says, the early church grew not only because its members preached the gospel, but also because they lived the gospel. Amen? 
what are we called as Christians to do? We are called to die to what? To self daily. Amen? And, uh, you know, I, I, I must say this. When my, uh, just as a testimony, when my wife got sick, right, I believe that we are living like the early church because the care that the church members give to us, I am telling you, I pray to God, I said, Lord, let this remain with us forever. Our behavior, how the, the church members, church family treated my wife and cared for us. I am so grateful and I thank God that I'm a part of this church. But I don't want it to be just for who you know and who you love. It must be for every member of the church. Amen? And I have prayed honestly and asked God, let this live on inside of us. And this is what the early church did, right? Itself, uh, the pen of its inspiration said that self must die and our life must be laid hid in Christ so that he can, it can show out in the way we treat people. The early church members, even though persecution came about them, when they left and they ran, they didn't just run to hide, they went and spread the gospel and they cared for each other. You know, you know that they, they took all the stuff and they brought it to the church and said, look, this is all we have and we, we know what, what, what happened with, uh, what's his name and his wife, right? That they, they, they you know, they, they uh, what's his name again? Yes, Ananias and Sapphira, right? Because they sold what they had because they, they, we, they saw that uh, some of the other members you know, sold all that they had and brought to the church. So they wanted to do the same thing, but they didn't have to. You know, they, they, they came and lied and said that we, we sold all and we brought it, but it's only part they brought. You know, so we must know that uh, this is why whenever we have anything and we asking people to make an uh, 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 effort to, to give, you know, you must talk with God and make a decision of yourself and don't try to be like anybody else. You do what is best for you and God knows what it is and you plead with God and let him know what you're going to do, right? But Matthew 28, 18 says here that uh, Jesus said that uh, all power is given unto him, right, in heaven and earth. The reason why he said this, because he... So, the, the early church cared for the community, and because of this, members were added to the church daily, as Sister Smith uh, mentioned, about 5,000 men, and then uh, 3,000 added to the church. So this is what uh, we have to continue to do, right, uh, as members of God's family. Uh, closing here, it says that this is especially true in the light of his promised return. This world is facing an enormous crisis. Jesus' own predictions in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 foretell catastrophic conditions on the earth before his return. When Christ touches us with his healing grace, we long to touch others with the touch of Christ so that they can be made whole. Jesus sends us out into a broken world as ambassadors for Christ to touch others with his love. New Testament Christianity was characterized by the Christians' love for one another and their community. And brethren, let me tell you something. We cannot love other people if we don't have Christ's love in our heart. Christ is the one that places his love in our heart. And because he places love in our heart, it's going to spread out to others. Amen? So let us remember that we ask for the Holy Spirit each day so that the love of Christ can dwell in our heart and we're going to care for each other and love each other so that people are going to see that we are people of Christ. Amen? Thank you so much. Amen. Pastor Goldson is going to come to us with Thursday's lesson, A Legacy of Love. Testing, testing. Thank you very much. So glad to have a part in this. And Thursday's lesson is A Legacy of Love. 
John 13, all Christians have to know. You have to know that. And this might all men know that ye are what? My disciples, if you have what? Love one for another. I have called on the workmen of the church, Brother Jackson, Brother Kinsey, Daryl. All of them have tool bags. What's in a tool bag, everybody? Tools. When Satan started his mess in heaven, God had to go to his tool bag. How many tools does God have in his tool bag? One. It's called love. Now, God has given us a tool bag. Your tool bag encompasses your lesson and your B-I-B-L-E. Why? Because people love to bother Christians with their love. They like to pray on us. You are so-and-so. Well, the Bible has a tool. It says, be wise as a serpent and what? Harmless as a dove. I had a problem giving people money on the street. I asked Elder Preston. Elder Preston said, God said, feed the hungry. That's our job. And this Thursday's lesson points out how the church operated in A.D. 160 and A.D. 260 and how we operated during the pandemic and before the pandemic. We fed at the shelter down there. I personally went to see how our ladies was preparing the food. And they did a wonderful job. I wanted some while, Pastor, you can't have none. This is for the people down there. I said, all right, I'll live with that. And I went down to the shelter to see how I was being distributed. And they were treating our people terribly, especially Sister Annie Johnson. Some of those men said some rough things to her. And I didn't like that. And I don't know how the shelter got it, but they had the people come in, sit down, and we're going to serve you. We're not going to let you go through the line. That was love. Because I want to help and serve you doesn't mean you can come and say anything you want to say to me and treat me any kind of way. So when we had the pandemic, we had to clean everything up, put on the face shield. Mine was, I didn't like all of that face up, so I kept my six feet distance. And then there were times I had to put it on. But we are characterized in the book of Revelation as demonstrating who we are because God is love. We have to love our neighbors. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is true. You and I are going to run to the rocks and mountains. You better get you some good running shoes. Sister Gosa won't let me bring my walking shoes in the house. She said they stink, but those are some of the comfortablest shoes in the world I've got to walk in. You and I have a responsibility to pray that our flight is not when? Winter time or what? The Sabbath day. It's not going to lie. And all of that we have to do in L-O-V-E. So we're coming to the love school every Sabbath so that we can get what we're getting this morning, an adequate description of what Jesus was all about. Make no mistake about it. When you see the picture of Jesus on the cross, the artists are kind. They put a loin cross across his middle, but that wasn't the way he died. And so the inspired pen says we ought to spend a thoughtful hour every day thinking about Jesus. You just can't do some quick stuff with Jesus. You've got to sit down and read the Sabbath school lesson. You have to read the Bible. You have to read how, I treated, how they treated our Savior. And this portion of the lesson, how we have to treat mankind. But please be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Some folks say that God was not kind to Pharaoh. God was just as loving as he could be with Pharaoh. How many plagues did he give Pharaoh? Gave him 10 opportunities to see what I'm doing. 
I know all about that because I had a mother and a father who were who disciplined completely different. My mother believed in instant justice. I'm whipping you right now. We're going to get this out the way. One time she was so mad with me, she pulled the log off the fire pile and whipped me with it. But my daddy was the essence of love. We're going to pray about this thing. We're going to sit out a while. We're going to sing about it. We're going to discuss it. Then you're going to take all your clothes off. Then we're going to put it on you. He prayed before he whipped you, and he prayed after he whipped you. Then he let you testify. <laughs> Praise God for that love so I knew how to dis discipline my children. My mother disciplined in anger. I finally found out my mother lost her mother when she was two years old. She had nobody to teach her, so she, 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 she told me later in life, all I did was whipped. I didn't pray with you all like I should have. Now, she did devotion, but she was going to get that thing straight. Now, she was going to beat the devil out of you. My daddy was going to pray him out of you. And so I know that. So now, as Christians, as we study the Sabbath school lesson, thank God for the great controversy because it is a mystery how Satan could sit there and fall in love with himself. And God was ready to meet it. And he's given us the tools in our tool bag as to how to love. So now, listen, ladies and gentlemen, having passed it, I went to school in Michigan. I sold books on the street in New York and New Jersey and, and Philadelphia. I don't mean it. I don't know. I was from the South, just as country as I could be, and dealing with people who dealt with things wholly different from me. But I had to learn how to love people because God loves people, hates what everybody, S-I-N, sin. The Lord even put me in jail so that I could learn how to love in there. I wasn't going to sing in there. Thank God they put us in there in the holding cells and we... And one of the other girls started singing, and I didn't have a choice but to sing. Help me out in that prison. Help me to know that's not the place you want to be unless God puts you there. All right? One of the prisoners cussed us out, and before it was all over, he said, y'all sound good. <laughs> because God tells us, you are my disciples. And sometimes we have to express some tough love, am I right? But we do it in love. My daughter got on, I didn't know how to take a television out of my children's room. Anyway, she got an $800 worth of telephone bill. And I called Southern Bell. And the Lord had to let me know, Mark, why are you fussing at this lady? They were so nice, they let me pay it in three months. Now I had to go home and discipline my daughter. Took the television out the room, took the telephone out the room, teach your Sabbath school lesson, we're gonna read your Bible together, go in there and talk with them, all in love. God has to deal with us too. This might all men know that you are what everybody? My disciples. If you have what? Love one for another. In closing, my neighbor, when the big storm came back two or three years ago, he parked his car and he couldn't get out in the snow. So I went and dug him out of the snow, something I learned how to do up at the seminary up in Michigan. And because of where I lived, I had to get a lot of people out of the snow, especially ladies. The snow plow only went down the middle of the street so people would get there, they get stuck, and I'd show them how to get out. So after it was all over and I got, got him out, my neighbor said, how much do I owe you? I said, you owe me nothing. He said, you mean to tell me you're going to get me out of this snow and you're not going to charge me anything? And the devil said, go and argue with him, charge him something. I said, isn't it my right if I choose to help you out of the snow to do that? He said, wow, I ain't never seen nobody like you. Glad. Praise the Lord. 
I wanted to do it. God has called on you to give this gospel message to who, everybody? Everyone. And to do it because you're in love, as the elder said, you're in love with who? The Lord. You're in love with the Lord. And that's why we're here at church. Because we have a responsibility to live like Jesus. Even in Oakwood, Arthur and I used to play football against each other. And sometimes they declared I wasn't fair. But we still was in love. Don't ever forget in this church, God reserved the right to change any vote that we make. Because we're in love with him and he knows what's best for us. Thank you so much for letting me have a part. Um, uh, Pastor Goldstein for um, uh, for that uh, summary. The devil knows that the church is the instrument by which God leads his people into the kingdom. And the devil also knows that if he confounds the church, then he makes it difficult for those who are trying to get into the kingdom to enter. So persecution is just one of the means by which the devil, uh, you know, seeks to confound and to conflict and to uh, make it difficult for the saints to enter the kingdom of God. Um, but we are, you know, assured in the scripture that we will have tribulations. But amidst those tribulations, the scripture tells us also be thou faithful unto death. Even if death is a prospect, we must be faithful. Um, like the three Hebrew boys, uh, actually fellows, they were not boys. <laughs> um, the, like the three Hebrew young men, um, they were careful in standing before the king and explaining to the king their position as believers. We are not careful to answer you in this matter, but we will not bow. If you throw us into the furnace, we will not bow. And uh, if the Lord we serve is able to save us, but if he doesn't, we will not bow. And in doing so, they became living testimonies of God's ability to save those in terrible times or caught up in tribulations and persecution. And God is able not just to lead us through persecution, but to deliver those he needs to deliver. But the, the end result of persecution, of course, is to uh, prepare the church for entrance into his everlasting uh, reward that he has prepared for us. So, not, uh, during the time of the early church, of course, as was said before, the, um, one of the uh, end result of that persecution was the growth of the church. As more and more souls were persecuted, more and more souls entered the kingdom or entered the church. And the church grew amidst the persecution. Now, today... Uh, to be honest, our church is not thriving, especially in North America. Now, we could debate as the reasons why, but we do know from history that the church grows in persecution. Now, I'm not calling for persecution at all. You know, that's not what I'm doing. I'm saying that God knows who's ready and how, uh, uh, how uh, the method by which they will be uh, easily led in or easily persuaded to come in. When they see folks standing up for their faith, they will be impressed by one man, one person, one woman, one individual with the conviction that God has told me to do this, and if I stand up for him, he will stand up for me. Folks will look back and say, if that little girl or that little boy, that little old man can do that, Maybe this is the way that I should go. So God uses persecution. He allows persecution because he knows, like with Paul, 
When Paul was going to Jerusalem, Paul knew. He called the elders together and he tells them, I will not see your face anymore. Sometimes I read that. When I read that, I thought to myself, why did Paul insist on going? Knowing that he would not see their faces again. But he went. Because in going, Paul became an instrument of salvation on his way to Rome. So many souls were led into the church just because Paul was in a boat trapped with fellow prisoners and soldiers. So God knew. And so Paul insisted on going to Jerusalem, knowing full well that it would be his last trip. So, in, uh, 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 as we um, look forward to the end times, of course the end time is upon us, but uh, as the um, the end time events progress. Some of us, we don't know what the Lord has in store for us. Some of us might not live to see it. Yes, indeed. But whatever the situation that God allows us to experience, we are told that, uh, was it, who was it, um, in, in back in the, in the book of Psalms, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. Even in the midst of persecution, God is still able to rescue those that need to be rescued, but more importantly, use us to be a living testimony for those who are ready to enter into his kingdom. So be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. This is the message of authentic Christianity. Authentic Christianity means being willing to sacrifice ourselves for the cause of Christ because that's what Christ did for us. And when we, do as, when we are ready to do as he has done, then he will be ready to defend us and, of course, deliver unto us the rewards he has prepared for all of us. Thank you, Madam. It's been a beautiful lesson and it's been very eye-opening for me. And I just want us to realize, I have to realize, I'm gonna say me, love conquers all. The essence of our lesson is that love steps in and love, even through persecution, God loves us so much that he will not allow us to take on more than we can bear. Have you ever thought that your weight was so heavy that you couldn't handle any more? And I have to realize and understand that God, in his infinite wisdom, knows how much we can bear. And this is not something that I rehearse a lot of times, and I, Reginald and I talk about it. I say through all of the tragedy and all of the this, that, and the other thing, somebody is going to be saved. Amen. That's my hope and that's my prayer. So what we walk in today is love. No matter what, friend, enemy, friend of me, however they say it, we must operate in love. And I just want to thank these fine scholars, you know, I'm not into this like that right there, you know, being up front trying to teach, you know, we have different gifts and mine is not teaching, it might be a little preaching every now and then. So I just thank God for these fine scholars that allowed me to be in their midst today. And at this time we're going to take our offering, is that correct? Okay, may those that are in charge, we'll take our offering at this time. Pull out your big bills, no jingle jangle, no, I'm just kidding. Troubled so much, you don't know what 
until you could not find somebody real in your soul you can feel you try and try so you could not Just we thank you and we glorify you for this beautiful Sabbath day that you have given us. And Lord God, we just thank you that the opportunity that we've had to study your holy word, that we will find through it all that your word is wrapped in love and help us to walk accordingly. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
thousand situations. Jesus is mine Wherever I have to go Everywhere I know that he watches me And when the storm clouds rise Even when my faith is tried, Jesus will light up my way, give strength for today. All of the time, I'll just be fine. Jesus is mine. Whatever I have to do. So when the hard times come by, tears fill my eyes, joy is deep inside. I can tell you why, oh, I know that Jesus loves me all of the time. Jesus is mine. Jesus is mine.
the Lord has made. He calls the hours his own. Let heaven rejoice, let earth be glad, and praise surround the throne. Therefore we say, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We set our work aside and leave our cares behind on this day of Sabbath rest. On this holy day, we've come to give you praise on this day of Sabbath. to 11 remember six days shall thou labor do all thy work but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God in it thou shall not do any work thou thy man servant nor thy maid servant nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. John 3, 16 and 17. For God, the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this blessed occasion that we can come before you on this your holy sabbath day thank you for your mercy and your grace and your love we ask O oh heavenly father that even in our worship today you would be lifted up you will be praised you will be glorified that we will see you anew today that we will be drawn closer to you and when we should have left this place lord we'd have said that it would have, it was good that we have been in your presence today let the people of god say Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church family. Our announcements for the week are as follows. Blessed are those who give of themselves. With warmest thanks for all of your help, with love, the Carolyn Todd and family. To East Market Street Church, God has been so gracious in allowing me to see another birthday and 32 years of marriage, and this time we were together as a family. We are indeed blessed and thankful and also humbled by the love and support of the church. 
Brian continues to heal with every passing day, and for this we say to God be the glory. With love, Brother Brian and Sister Bridget Barrett. On our special prayer list, we have Nala Sumter, Elder Thurman Watlington, Margaret Sirwa, who is at Adams Farm Living and Rehab, room 111. Also, Miss Linda Fuller, please keep her in your prayer. She was rushed to Cone Hospital on last evening. Funeral services for Bessie Louise Watson are as follows. They will take place on Monday, April the 15th at 12 noon. Family visitation at 11.30 a.m. here at the church gymnasium. Interment will take place at the Forest Lawn Cemetery. The family is requesting the following services from East Market Street. Ushers, deacons for pallbearers, deaconess for floral bearers. Thank you for your willingness to serve. The North Carolina a and SDA Aggies donation drive has been extended. Um, if you will look outside in the short hall, you'll find a blue box and a list of items that are needed for the school that they are trying to collect donations for, the GTCC Early College Teachers. The Prison Ministries team will have a brief important meeting today after service in the Blue Room. You will be outlining the program and visitation to White Stone on, White Stone on Sabbath, April the 20th at 2 p.m. There will also be discussion on the orientation visit at Davidson Correctional Center at 1400 Thompson Street in Lexington on Monday, April the 29th. The time will be from 5 until 6.30 p.m. for that orientation. Our calendar for the week. On tomorrow, the Prison Ministries team uh, virtual meeting has been canceled. It has been rescheduled for Sunday, April the 28th. The Facilities Committee meeting has been canceled for tomorrow. The Golden Age Society meeting is scheduled for tomorrow at 12 noon in the Blue Room. Also on tomorrow, Usher's meeting at 12.15 p.m. in the gym. Also on Sunday, the Health Food Store will be open from 2 until 3 p.m. Tuesday, April the 16th, the Golden Age Society will have their exercise class at 11.30 a.m. And on Wednesday the 17th, virtual Zoom prayer meeting at 7 p.m. The following are community uh, service announcements from the St. Matthews United Methodist Church. Their fellowship choir presents the Evolution of Praise, their 20th anniversary concert. The location is 600 East Florida Street in Greensboro, and the time will be on tomorrow, April the 14th at 3 p.m. The admission is free, but they are accepting non-perishable food items, and the donations are greatly appreciated. This concert will feature the voice of the son of our very own member, Peyton Naylor. He is the son of Andre and Mia Naylor. Also, on next Sabbath afternoon, the Shining Stars will celebrate their 44th anniversary. The time will be at uh, 6 p.m., but the doors will open at 4. The theme is, I'll go if I have to go by myself with Brother Bobby Nobles. The location of the concert will be St. Peter's United Methodist Church in Randleman, North Carolina. The following are South Atlantic Conference announcements. The conflict resolution training continues every Tuesday through the month of April at 7 p.m. This is a free webinar. You will receive a certificate uh, at the end of the course training. The presenter will be Dr. Everton Ennis, the General Vice President of the conference. The South, Atlant South Atlantic Conference Women's Ministries presents Sabbath celebrations. On today will take place in Georgia at the West Broad Street SDA Church in Savannah. The guest speaker, Dr. Joyce Woods. On the following Sabbath, April the 20th, it will take place at the Shiloh SDA Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Guest speaker, Dr. Dunkley. And our very own April Smith will be speaking on April the 27th at the Praise Tabernacle SDA Church in Whiteville, North Carolina. You're asked to register online for your seats. Uh, other than the guest speakers, lunch will be provided, panel discussion, concert, and giveaways. So ladies and others, please register. The South Atlantic Conference Sabbath School and Children's Ministries will sponsor a training. The next training will take place on next Sabbath, April the 20th, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Please register for this event. More information and flyers are on the bulletin board table. Camp meeting this year is June the 7th through the 15th. 
Our South Atlantic Conference Women's Prayer Line is open Sunday through Friday, 5 a.m. until 6 a.m. Please check your emails for further information. Sunset today is at 7.51 p.m. You all have a blessed and prosperous week. Good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Sister Robin Patterson and I am, I don't feel comfortable with this. I am head usher here at East Market Street and I am here to recruit some ushers. We need your help. <laughs> um, we are a group that usher every Sabbath. Um, if you would like to come on board, you will usher one Sabbath out of the month. Um, we ask that you come with a heart for people, a heart to serve others. So we need you. I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm used to just singing in front of people, <laughs> but not really speaking in front of people. So I see all your lovely faces. So can you give me a smile? So I'll feel much more comfortable up here. <laughs> um, I know you all see me practically every Sabbath back there at the door, um, greeting everyone. And it is my pleasure to serve. It is my passion to serve. I have a heart to serve. I have a heart that, that it, my desire is to, to serve like Jesus and to love like Jesus. And so when I'm standing back there at that door, meeting everyone that comes in, I want you to know that it, it really does. It really melts my heart. I want you to know that I, I love each and every person that comes through that door. Sometimes it's, it's challenging. Ushering can be challenging. But at the end of the day, it, it, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I just want you all to come join us. So if you want to, just speak to me or one of the ushers that's back there in the back. And I thank you for allowing me to give this spotlight this morning. Have a great Sabbath day. Good morning. I am Sister Jackie Jackson, and I am your religious liberty leader. So I'm here to kind of wrap up the Religious Liberty Campaign, which went from January through March 31st. And I just want to remind us how blessed we are to be here worshiping in this place today without any kind of governmental interference or interference from any other outside forces. We are experiencing a spirit of religious freedom. And I want to truly thank you for we raised almost $1,100 for religious liberty this time. So the religious liberty campaign is over, but religious liberty still goes forward. You know, there are a lot of issues that are still on the forefront with religious liberty. One is parental rights, and that's the fundam fundamental right of parents to direct the education and upbringing of their children. But today we see many of the states who are making laws and classes and all of these things within our educational system without even involving the parents. Another issue that we hear of almost daily is abortion rights. And then let's not forget Christian nationalism. This is a movement that wants to bend the laws in favor of, this, of their religious beliefs without regard for the beliefs of others. And just think about this. A pastor 
had preached his sermon. He did his closing prayer, closed his Bible, went out to meet his parishioners. And then one of his members comes up and says, where did you get all of that liberal thinking? And he said, the message came from the Beatitudes, from Matthew. You know, this is one of the core teachings of Christianity. The member replied, but it's too weak. We don't need that kind of preaching. And this is just an example how even the fundamental Christian beliefs are being considered too woke for this world today. And now we have, and I'm sure you've heard, the, let me get the name of it right. It's called the God Bless the USA Bible. And it comes complete with the, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Pledge of Allegiance, and even a handwritten copy of the song, God Bless the USA. And it is being pushed by none other than our president, number 45. All of these things are leaning toward the day when there will be no more separation of church and state. And our religious freedoms will be taken away. The Religious Liberty Department fights against these and other issues that affect our freedom of conscience. So again, I say thank you for your support and I solicit your prayers. Not that this nation will stand, but that we as individuals will stand and that we will go forth, spread the gospel as Christ has taught us because there will come a day when we will no longer have that freedom. So let us do what God asks us to do while we still have our freedom of choice. Good morning, thank you so much for sharing that, Sister Jackson. Thank you also, Sister Patterson, for sharing about the ushers. Uh, just wanna say welcome to you. Good morning, good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to those who are online with us. Thank you so much for being digital disciples and being a part of our, our space and our place today. Thank you so much for being here in person as well. Uh, you could have gone any place to worship, but you chose to worship here, and for that we are eternally grateful. Uh, we want to thank God that we are on this side of the turf. Come on, say amen. Not on the underside, and we just want to give him the praise and the honor today. Uh, just want to just pause. Are there any individuals that are worshiping with us uh, as visitors? Would like you to recognize? Would like to recognize you at this time? And just uh, if, even if you put it in the chat uh, that you're visiting with us, we'd love to have you as a part of the family of God. Uh, if you're there, you want to share that with us, where you're from and who you are. You can stand at this time and share that. We just want to praise God for your presence. We want to thank God for the time that you have taken to be a part of our family. We have back in the back, and Mike is coming to you in a second. Thank you so much. Good morning to Good morning. everyone. Good morning. I'm, I am Halsey's mother, the second time coming here. Amen. And I'm from Jamaica. Thank you so much. And the daughters, daughter and sons with us. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Good morning, everyone. I am Halsey's Hammond's sister, and I am from Jamaica. Amen. Thank you. Amen, amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Halsey Hammond's brother, and I'm from New York. Amen, amen, amen. So we have. Good morning, everyone. Amen. <laughs> I'm Althea's brother. I'm from Florida. Amen, amen. Good 
What a blessing to have family. Come on, say amen. Thank you so much for taking the time to come uh, from New York, from Florida, uh, from Jamaica. Come on, say amen. Thank you for being a part of our family. And thank you for lending your, uh, your daughter to us. Thank you so much. We praise God and your sister to us. And we just want to thank God for the opportunity of being a part of the family of God. Again, welcome to our service today at EMS. I uh, want you to know that you've chosen the right place. God is in this place, and his name will be honored and glorified. Please continue to lift up uh, the Watson family and the loss of Sister Bessie Louise Watson, who will be funeralized on Monday. Uh, continue to pray for that family. Uh, continue also to pray for the Fuller family. Uh, one of the daughters in, is in uh, Moses Cone right now. Let's continue to pray for her. I talked and prayed with her sister uh, earlier t today. Uh, and uh, just, I, will, I prayed with Cheryl. And I uh, just want you to know that we're praying for the family. We'll get a chance to check in. But uh, thank you for your prayers for all of those throughout Zion, those that are still healing, those that are still uh, making their transitions in a positive way, not a negative way. Uh, they are actually healing and they are getting stronger. Come on, say amen. And God is still blessing. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, I had some technical challenges, but I thought I heard the last part of, of, of a praise report. And uh, I just caught a lot, last part of it. Uh, and that was on uh, Brother Hill. I heard that he's cancer free. Come on, say amen. Come on, say amen. Amen. I'm just so happy to see God still working and God still hearing and God still answering prayers. And I give God the praise and give him the glory and uh, give him the honor. I'm so glad to know that God is still doing what God does well. Um, we do want you to also continue uh, to pray for the progress of our property. I call it our property. Uh, negotiations have been going well, uh, and the individuals that came to inspect and check everything out, uh, we will know this coming week uh, so that we could be able to proceed, amen, in acquiring what God has gifted us. Come on, say amen. And so by God's grace, we still encourage you uh, and every one of you to keep on giving because we want to still do this thing debt free. Come on, say amen. And make sure that we do it correctly. So continue to pray for uh, uh, what's happening with the Presbyter as well as us as we work together to acquire the property that God has given us. Again, God bless us. God bless you, God keep you, and this coming Wednesday, right after prayer meeting, we'll have a brief board meeting as well online. So looking forward to see you. God bless you, heaven smile on you. My prayer is that heaven will come down and glory will fill our hearts. Good morning and happy Sabbath, East Market Street. This is the time where we lift our voices to heaven. Would you join me in standing as we sing this morning's hymn of worship? Marvelous Grace, it is hymn 109. All together on that first verse. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace. That is greater, 
second stanza Sin and despair like the sea Waves cold threaten the soul Grace that is greater Yes, grace untold Points to the refuge, the mighty Let's bring that chorus out Grace God's grace Grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe you that are long see his face will you this moment his grace receive all oh, grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace grace let's lift our voices to heaven and sing that chorus come on and sing grace grace that's right, a grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God, grace, grace that is. You can do it one more time as we sing about God's grace, 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 God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is grace than all our sin. Is there a hallelujah in the house for God's grace? Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. I am excited. Do you know why? Huh? It's prayer time. Amen? When praise goes up, what happens? Blessings comes down. Amen? That's why I'm excited. I'm always excited about prayers. Amen? Would you mind standing with me? And while I petition God's throne on our behalf, I ask you that you can pray silently to God because he wants to hear from you too. Amen? Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Our loving God, you are merciful, gracious, mighty. You are a healer. You are our provider. You are our sustainer. You are our redeemer. We come this morning thanking you for who you are and what you have done for every one of us. Even though we might not recognize it, we know that you are the one that kept us on the busy highways and byways and provided food for us, clothing and everything we needed so that we can come into your place of worship today. Lord, there are so many among us that are struggling with various situations, sickness, finances, relationships, health. But Lord, you said we must cast all of our cares before you. So we come today to bring all our cares before you so that when we leave here, 
because we have faith in you, in your healing power. We have seen what you have done for so many of the saints of this church, the brethren of this church, that you have healed through various procedures and so forth. So we know that you are a continual healer. You're doing it continuously and we know that you would do that for our loved ones that we lift up before you, for our husbands and wives and our children, we place all before you, Lord. I would not call name for those that are sick and shut in because of my human frailties. I don't want to leave out any name, but Lord, you know who they are and we place them before you. Address every situation as only you can. And Lord, we give your name the praise and the honor and the glory even before it's done because we know that you're a God that cannot lie. So we claim your promises today. We are thankful for the visitors who are worshiping with us here today, Lord. We know that you brought them here for a purpose. There's a word that you have for them to hear. And we're thankful that you have given your man servant a word that he would share for every one of us and they would benefit from it, even those that are viewing us online. We pray, Lord, that the word that would be shared, that it would touch their hearts. Those who have not yet accepted Christ as their Savior, we pray that they would yield to you, Lord, and accept you as their personal Savior. Lord, we want to lift up the property that you have given into our hands, Lord. We know that things, procedures have to take place, Lord, but we wait on you, Lord. We know that you are working things out for us so that your name would be glorified. So we wait on you. And we know that when all is over, that we would be able to step in to the property, the land that you have given to us. Lord, we ask forgiveness for any shortcoming we had this week, Lord. But Lord, we pray that you would be with us individually and collectively. Help us that we would have a desire to have the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can do the work confidentially and strongly so that many souls would come to know you, whom to know is life eternal. Lord, we ask that you would give us that peace that passeth all understanding, even in times of our trials and tribulation. But we know that we cannot receive that without having the Holy Spirit in our lives. So Lord, we pray that you would accept our worship here today. We come to worship you because we love you. And you have shown us, <clears throat> excuse me, that you love us with an everlasting love. So Lord, what else can we do but worship you and give you the praise and the honor that is due to you and you alone. We lift up your man servant today, Lord. We pray that you would give him a double portion of your spirit as he bring this word and not only the word today, Lord, but as you lead him continuously day to day as he do the work that you have brought him to do to lead this flock. And Lord, we as your sheep would follow him as he follow you. So bless us, guide and direct us, Lord. And I pray that everyone that is in this place today, when they leave here, they would say that it was good that we came into the house of the Lord. I thank you and I praise you because I ask it all in the wonderful and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, would the deacons come forward to take up today's tithes and offering?
as the deacons pick up today's tithes and offering, I just want to share with you that giving tithes and offering and being faithful is not for God, it's for me and you. And as we are faithful, as pastor always say, God didn't call us to be famous, but to be faithful is for us. Amen? So brethren, don't fail to be faithful to God. He has done so much for us. What else can we do but to be faithful to him? Amen? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that they may be meat in mine house. And prove ye now, hear it, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that you have given us to show our faithfulness in giving back to you. Lord, we pray that you would use these funds to help accomplish the work that you have called it to do, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that as we continue to show our love and our faithfulness, that others looking on would want to be a part of what we are of. Bless us now to this end and bless these funds we ask, because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now ask Sister McFarlane to come forward to do the children's story. Amen. Sabbath boys and girls and happy Sabbath to the older boys and girls all right today our story is about faith and trust the two goes together anybody know what it is to trust yeah you know tell us Sabrina what it is to trust to trust God To know that somebody can um, do something um, and they're good friends. Good. All those things are about trust and hope. And as, oh, you have, mm. what is it? You know um, about trust? Yeah. Oh, okay. And adults, we all know about trust. And one of my big things, too, is apart from trusting God and going to work and expect at the end of the week to get a paycheck. I'm trusting that after I work, my employer will pay me, right? 
I'll be rewarded for the work that I've done. So today, I want to share with you and do a little demonstration of how we can have faith in someone or trust someone else. The story is told of a little girl who was traveling on an airplane. And while they were soaring up in the air, they ran into some bad weather and they were experiencing turbulence. And as the plane rocked, people began to get scared and people started praying, oh God, help me, help me. Everybody was so afraid. Anybody has ever traveled in an airplane? No? Yes, you did. And was it all smooth ride? Were you afraid at some point? Yes, I was traveling in an airplane once and there was a lot of bad weather and the plane was rocking and turning and the pilot had to do an emergency landing. Well, this particular day when the plane was going through these clouds and rough weather, people were screaming, crying, but finally the pilot was able to land the plane at a close by airport. And when they were landed and everybody was calm, a gentleman looked at the little girl and said, why weren't you afraid? Everybody thought they were going to die, but you were just happy reading your book and smiling. And the little girl said, I was not afraid because my father is the pilot. My father was the pilot, so I was not afraid because I trusted my father and more than anybody else, my father wanted me to be safe, so I trusted my father to take care of me. Now today, I want to do a little demonstration of trust. I, I need a volunteer. Who wants to volunteer for me? Now, I'm going to ask you, Ty, you. No, Tyron? Yeah. No, you have to do everything that I say. You have to obey me. You have to trust me. You know, we trust God and we realize and we left our home this morning, we we're going to come to church and we we're going to get here safely. The car wasn't going to crash and we believe we were going to get to church safely. No, I want you to have complete trust in me. Can you trust me? Can you trust me that I won't hurt you? All right. So let's see how trust goes. I want you to turn around. Turn around. I want you to walk forward. Stop. Oops. All right. I want you to go. Sorry. I want you to walk again. Go along. Walk. Walk. Go forward. Go forward. Turn around. Continue walking. Turn around. Stop. Continue walking. I'm going to direct you. Turn around. Come on. Continue walking. Walk backwards. Walk backwards. Walk backwards. Walk backwards. Walk backwards. Sit. Sit. Ah. Were you afraid? Good job. Good job. So he listened and he trusted me that I wouldn't let him fall, right? Let's give him a big hand. Yes. So it is the same when we put our trust in God and, and we put our, hold this for me, 
put our trust in our parents. Sometimes we ask for things. We might ask for a bike, and we expect, we believe that our parents are going to give it to us, right? So today, I want us always to trust God and to believe that God will always take care of us and to believe and to obey our parents because our parents want what's best for us, right? But more than anybody else, God wants us to obey him and to trust him because he will always take care of us. I want to share two texts with you today. And the first one is Hebrews 11 and verse 6. And it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. And the next is Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. And it says, trust in the Lord with all your hearts and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. So boys and girls, this week I want you in all ways to remember that you can trust God, you can obey God, because God wants what is best for us. And he promised to always take care of us. He promises to, that he will always take care of us. So what are we going to do this week? Trust God. trust God. We're going to trust and obey God always, because God will always take care of us. All right. Can I have a volunteer to pray? You want to pray? You know how to pray? Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. For bringing us to church. Thank you for bringing us to church. Please help us. Please help us. To trust you. To trust you. Always. Always. Amen. Amen. Dear Jesus, be with us in a mighty special way. We love you. Thank you for us trusting you and being faithful. Amen. Amen. All right, boys and girls, always we're going to trust in the Lord, all right? And we're going to always obey, right? Oh, you can go back to your seat. Jesus loves the little children. Come on. Morning, church family. Our first scripture reading for this morning will be taken from Genesis chapter 13, verse 11 and 12. Verse 11 reads, Then Lot chose from all the plan, and Jordan and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Verse 12 reads, Abraham. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Our second, our second scripture reading will be taken from Matthew chapter five, verse thirteen. It reads, "Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has has lost its savor, where?" wherewith shall it be salted it is then forth good for nothing but the to be cast out and to be treaded under foot of men may the lord add rich blessing to the reading hearing and doing of his word amen this morning, the Holy Spirit gave me the text in James, chapter 1, verse 12, and it simply states, Blessed is the man that is steadfast and endureth until the end, because he will receive a crown of life. God promised that. And I want to hone in on the trial part of that verse. 
because this song talks about trials. And it says, for the trials that the Lord allows to come in our lives, we should always thank him. We may not always thank him, but we should because he knows exactly what's best for us. So those trials come to make us strong. They come to grow us spiritually, but they also come to test our faith. Oftentimes, I have failed in that realm. And you want to know why? Because I let my human nature get in the way. I let my human nature shout what I should do instead of letting God with his soft prompting lead me to what I should do. That's my prayer and I hope it's your prayer as well that we will allow the voice of the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us so that we too can experience receiving the crown of life and to see Jesus' face, his face, and live with him for eternity. Is that your prayer? Amen.
and surrender to everything. Life is so song that took me way back. What a beautiful selection. Praise God. Uh, we also want to thank Camille for the scripture. Come on, say amen. amen. Thank you so much. We want to thank God for every time we have a children's story and we focus on our children. It's a blessing. Thank you so much, Sister McFarlane. And uh, we want to thank my uh, colleagues in ministry that's here with us today. Uh, just want to praise God for all of our elders. Uh, they are my colleagues, and I just thank God for what they do every single week. And uh, I will be without a hand without Sister uh, Gaddy. What a blessing. What a blessing. This church is blessed uh, to have individuals like that serving. And again, all of, our, all of our musicians, thank you so much for your ministry today. Uh, we just want to pause to give God the praise. Today we want to go to a place, and I'm going to merge uh, two specific thoughts today. Uh, and that merger has to do with what we started off with on last week. We actually began with looking at the fact that we are light. Come on, say amen. amen. What a bl blessing to know that we are light. But uh, we are also not just light, but we are also salt. What did I say? We are both salt. So today, uh, in the book of Genesis, we're going to be spending some time in that book. And we're going to be going through a, a lesson that will bring us to where we need to be today. Uh, Today, I really want us to look very carefully at Matthew 5. And I know we started off with Genesis, and we're going to go back to the 13th chapter of Genesis uh, as our anchor te text today. But uh, Jesus is speaking in Matthew, the fifth chapter. And uh, he says something that's very powerful that we need to look at. I want to make sure that we're on point and on purpose with this. When you have things in your portfolio, you need to always shift. Come on, say amen. Okay. So we see in Matthew uh, chapter 5 uh, a very special instruction that God gives us. And we just want to focus on that for a second. Matthew chapter 5. And uh, when you're there, let me hear you say amen. So the Bible says very clearly to us, 
that not only are we the light of the world, but the Bible says in verse 13 very powerfully, it says, ye are the what? Ye are the what? Ye are the salt of the earth and what? Okay, and if the salt has lost his what? Savior, it's what? Where shall it be salted? It is henceforth what? Good for nothing and to be done what? Cast out and what else? Trodden under the foot of men. I just want you to just pause for a second and recognize that the two most important elements that God deals with, uh, he deals with light. Light is necessary for growth. Light is necessary for survival. But God says not only are we the light of the world, as we dealt with last week, uh, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, but he tells us that we are called to flavor the earth. What did I just say? We are called to flavor the world. Uh, we are called to help preserve the world. If you don't know this, you need to know this. Salt has the tendency of preserving. Before refrigeration started, they used to actually salt meats. Have you ever heard of that? They used to cure it that way. And they used to keep it that way. And when it was time to cook, they would uh, soak that meat and take out some of the salt. You didn't hear me. And be able to now use that. Salt was a preservative. And today, as we deal with this message entitled, Pitching Your Tent Towards Sodom, and the saga of the salt. My prayer is that the Lord will bless us to be salt as well as light. Father, right now we ask that you will step in, take full control. God, we recognize that you're trying to teach us a lesson by blending what's in the New Testament with what is in the Old. God, uh, you have an instruction for us today. And as we think about and read about and actually experience the reality of pitching one's tent. Today we ask, oh God, that you will step in the midst of our lives, change us so powerfully that we will be careful as to where we go and how we comport ourselves. Lord, we will see your mercy and your goodness and your love and kindness today. But Lord, we will also see today where you have brought us to and how we ought to be careful how we comport ourselves and how we connect ourselves. Now, Lord, hide this lump of clay behind the cross. Let people not see me, but let them hear from you. And God will be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So here it is. We're going to deal with pitching one's tent towards Sodom. If you look very carefully in the book of Genesis, you'll find out that God called a man by the name of Abraham in chapter, 13, uh, chapter 12 of the book of Genesis, and he actually called him to do something very special. Go there with me real quickly. Genesis, the 12th chapter. The Bible says, now the Lord had said unto who? Abraham. He said, do what? Get thee out of thy what? That country and from thy what? Kindred and what? And from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And he says, and I will what? I will make thee a great nation. And I will what? Bless thee and what? Make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that what? Bless thee. And I will curse him that what? Curses thee. And in thee shall what? All the families of the earth be blessed. Pause here for a moment. So God calls Abraham to divest. Abraham is already settled. Abraham is already in his senior times. Abraham has not had a child yet. 
But God tells him, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your country. I want you to leave your kinsmen. And I want you to go to a place that I will show you. I will make a great nation out of you. And I'll bless those that bless you. And I'll curse those that curse you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, does that sound like clear instructions to you? Does that sound pretty clear to you? And, and so the Bible says that after Abraham hears those instructions, watch very carefully. And this is the connecting piece. And Abraham, so Abraham, verse 4, did what? Departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And look at the next few verses. And who? And Lot went with him. And Abraham was how old? 75? 75 years old? When he departed out of Herod? And the Bible says, And Abraham took Sarah his wife, and Lot his what? His brother's son. And all their substance that they had what? Gathered. And the Bible says, and the what? Souls that what? They had gotten in Haran. And the Bible says, and they went what? Forth to go into the land of what? And into the land of Canaan they came. Now, I kept reading this, and I kept saying to myself, okay, you're following God. And I want you to understand, it's, it's, it's very important for us to follow God. But I want you to understand, it's more important to follow God all the way. Oh, you didn't hear me. Let me say it again. It's important to follow God, but it's more important to follow God all the way. You know, some of us, we will do some of what God says. And the other part of what God says, it's up for discussion. But I want you to understand, whatever God says, now, I, I, I got it, I kept reading it, I kept looking at it, and I kept seeing it, and, and the Lord said to me, that's the problem. I said, what's the problem, Lord? He said, he followed me, but he didn't follow me all the way. Listen to me very carefully. What in the world are you taking a lot with you? What part of the instructions of leave your kin folk? What part of the instructions of leave your family? Leave, leave those connecting parts. Leave them and you, you go. And your family, you go. But now the Bible says that, that, that Abraham, he follows God. He goes by faith to follow God, but he adds something to it. He takes a tag along to get along. You didn't hear me. I'm going to say it again. He takes a tag along to get along. He takes Lot with him. He takes who? Lot with him. I want you to understand that everybody that's along with you ain't going in your same direction. You didn't hear me. Let me say it again. Everybody that's journeying with you doesn't have, don't have the same perspective. And sometimes some of the some of, of, of the struggles you have in life is because who you're traveling with. Oh, I'm going to say it again. You know, some of us want to uh, allow people to hang around with us that mean us no good. And some of us allow people to hang around with us that, that when we really find out, they're actually uh, uh, leeches. They, they know how to get and get, but they don't really know how to give. So everybody that's hanging around with you don't really mean you the best. So God didn't tell him to take a lot. I kept looking at this thing, and I found out that some of the struggles in Abraham's life had to do with having other folk he had to deal with. And some of the stuff that you're going through has everything to do with the choices you've made and the decisions that follow. 
And some of what you're going through is because you didn't follow God all the way. You follow him in part. And so Abraham takes a lot with him and he journeys and God is blessing Abraham. But I want you to understand, as God is blessing Abraham, God is blessing those that are hanging with Abraham. God is blessing Lot. God blesses Abraham so much so that by chapter 13, which comes to our, uh, uh, our section, uh, by chapter 13, we find out that Abraham uh, uh, was, was blessed and, and God was giving him all kinds of blessing. And, and when you look around, the Bible says uh, uh, the land uh, uh, was not able to, to bear the sub the, the the, 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 the expansion of what Abra Abraham as well as Lot had. It, it, the Bible says they had all kinds of blessings. Abraham had flocks and herds and tents. Lot had it too. Come on, say amen. And the Bible says, uh, and, and, and the land was not able to do what? To bear them. That they might what? dwell together for for their substance was what was great so that what they could not dwell together therefore the bible says there was what strife between whom the herdsmen of abraham's cattle and the herdsmen of who lots cattle and and and, and, and the canaanites and the perizzites that, that dwelt there in the land. And, and the Bible says, and, and, and Abraham said unto Lot, listen to this principle, let there be no what? Strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we be what? In other words, Abraham says, we're kin. With bad brethren, don't let us fall out. Let there be no strife between us. Listen to what he says. He says, is not the whole land before thee? He says, separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou will take the what? Left hand, then I will what? Go to the right. Or if thou would depart to the what? Right hand, then I will what? Go to the left. And watch the character coming out in verse 10. And Lot did what? Lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of the what? Jordan, that it was how? Well watered and everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, even as the what? Garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou cometh unto Zorah. I want you to just understand what I'm seeing here. It's time to separate. Abraham gives the younger man the choice. Watch this. A well-groomed young man would have said, no, 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 you're my senior. I defer. You make the choice. You brought me here. God's blessed me because of you. You make the choice. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I go to the right. But, but, but Abraham gives Lot an opportunity to show himself. And Lot looks around and he sees something that grabs his attention. He sees a plush place. He sees a beautiful land. Patriarch and Prophets talks about uh, uh, the fertility of that area. It says that Sodom and all that area was so beautiful. It was almost like the garden of God. And, and, and here it is. Uh, 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 Lot sees it. 
And, and there's a problem because he sees it as the garden of God and as Egypt. Oh, you didn't hear me. Let me, let me, let me say it on this side. He sees it as the garden of God and Egypt. Why, why is that so important? Because, thank you for asking. Because anytime you look at stuff, if it looked too much like the church and the world, you got some problems. Oh, you didn't say it. Let me say it again. The garden of God and Egypt? That don't work. But Lot's mind was so bent on seeing what he sees and getting what he gets that he threw caution to the wind and he says, that's what I want. But who knows that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, Proverbs declares. And the end thereof is death. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. Uh, ask, ask Samson. She pleaseth me well. Not everything that looks good is good. You've got to make choices uh, under God's auspices. You've got to allow God to lead, God to direct. But no, he looks up. And the Bible says he chooses the well-watered area. He chooses the area that he desires. He chooses and he goes and he starts journeying east. And they separated themselves from one another. And the Bible says Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain. And the Bible says and in verse 12 of the 13th chapter and pitched his what? He pitched his tent towards Sodom. When you pitch your tent, listen to me very carefully. When you're pitching your tent towards something, what actually that means is every time you wake up in the morning and open up your tent doors, that's what you see. And the last thing you see when you come at night to go back into your tent, you see that again. When you're closing those doors, that's the last thing you see. When you open those doors, that's the first thing you see. Let me tell you something. Wherever a tree leans, that's where it's going to fall. Don't you ever forget that. Don't you ever forget that. Wherever a tree leans, that's where it falls. Lot came with Abraham. But when it was time to separate, you could see the character unveiling. You could see covetousness. You could see greed. You could see gain. And the Bible says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Now listen to me very carefully. Some of us are not trying to be in the world. Let me say this. Some of us try not to be off the world. But we're in the world. But we shouldn't be off the world. But some of us try to see how close we could stay to the Lord and still dip over. You know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> some of us try, try to play both ways. You know what I'm talking about. We, we try to come to church on Sabbath and then the rest of the week, you know, it's, you know. I'll see you later next week, Lord. And we're just as worldly and we just go and do whatever we want to do. And we think that is harmonizing. No, no, no. You can't serve two masters. Come on, say amen. Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. Sodom was the crossroads of the area. Sodom actually had, was, was the capital of the palm trees. It, it had all kinds of vegetation all year round. Sodom actually had a, 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 an atmosphere, a, a, a temperature that was so nice. All year long, flowers bloomed all over. Uh, uh, the palm trees were in full bloom. And, and all the vines were there. Uh, Sodom was the place that caravans used to come through. Made the market full of, of pearls and, and gold and, and jewels. Uh, and everything a person's heart could desire was found in Sodom. 
So they were idle. They were what? Idle. They were idle. They, they had a lot of time. So they didn't have to work hard. Have you ever heard an idle mind is the devil's workshop? And idle hands are the devil's what? Tools. <laughs> Am I going for too far back? Idle minds are the devil's workshop and idle hands are the devil's tools. Sodom and her sister Gomorrah were cities that God was looking at. It was a place that Lot was focused on. But I want you to understand Wherever we are in life, God expects us to be light and salt. And the question is always, what are we doing for the places that we occupy? Are the places affecting us or are we affecting the places? The folk we hang around, are they changing us or are we changing them? If you find yourself saying a little cuss word every now and then, watch the company that you're keeping. You didn't hear that. I didn't have to be taught to curse. I, I was not taught. Nobody sat down and said, this is how you curse. But I, but I started hanging around some folk. I started hanging around from so, some folk. And, and after a while, when I got mad, it came out. Nobody taught me how to curse. But I was hanging around some folk. And when I got mad, it came out. I said, oh, where did that come from? What's the company you keep? Lot has pitched his tent towards Sodom. I'm going to fast forward. Lot was captured and his family was captured. Abraham came and rescued him. God's been talking to Abraham all the time. And God was reminding Abraham at every time, I'm with you. I'm going to bless you. I don't care what you think about, but I will bless you. I'll make a great nation out of you. And every time God showed up, God was actually sharing with Abraham the promise. The promise. But I find out in Genesis, the 19th chapter uh, and verse 1, that, that, that you find a guy. His name is Lot. And the Bible says in the 19th chapter and, and, and verse 1, watch this. And we're going to go back to the 18th chapter in a quick second. But I want you to understand in the 19th chapter and verse 1, the Bible says this. And there came what? Two angels. To what? Sodom where? At evening. And what? Wait, 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 wait. It says, and there came two angels to Sodom at the evening. And the Bible says, and who was there? Oh, did you hear that? And Lot what? Sat where? In the gate of Sodom? And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. Here's a man who pitched his tent towards Sodom by 19th chapter, he's the gatekeeper. He's the commissioner. He's the mayor. He's hanging out in Sodom. If you pitch your tent towards something, nine times a ten, you're going to end up there. But I want to ask myself, what's happening in the meanwhile? In chapter 18, the Bible says three men 
Chapter 18 says, how many men? Three men. Abraham is out on a, on, a, on, on a place, and the Bible says, and the Lord appeared unto him in the what? Uh, plain of memory. And he said, what? As he sat in the tent, he looked out, and what happened? Oh, says, says, okay. Uh, he was there in the heat of the day. Amen. And the Bible says he lifted up his eyes, and lo, he saw what? Three men stood by him. And the Bible says, and uh, when he saw them, what did he do? Ran to meet them, and what else? He came and bowed himself uh, to, towards the, the ground, and, and he said, uh, my capital, L-O-R-D. My what? My Lord, if I now have what? Have favor in thy sight. He says, pass not away, I pray thee, uh, for, 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 from thy servant. And I want you to understand, he says, let me go ahead and water, get a little water, and, and, and get a little something going, and I want to feed you, I want to take care of you. And when he left, and he went and fetched everything, and, and they came and they ate, and they enjoyed fellowship with Abraham, the Bible says they got up to go. And as he took butter and milk and gave them things to eat at that time, they were getting up to go. And God gives Abraham a promise about Sarah. Come on, say amen. He reminds him again, because he told him in, in, in chapter uh, 17 the same thing. She's going to have a child, and, and, and God's going to bless you, and, and he's going to take care of you and everything else. And, and, and so now God has promised Abraham again, I'm going to do for you what I promised I would do for you. And, and then God looks around, and he says, shall I hide from Abraham, verse 17, that thing which I do seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and a mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall what? Be blessed in him. For I know him that he will what? Command his children and his household after him. And shall keep the way of my what? of the Lord to do justice and judgment. And so here it is, the Lord says, I'm gonna share. And I want you to understand, the Lord speaking with Abraham. You have two angels and the Lord, listen to me. And, and I want you to understand, he says to Abraham, I have come down to see what I need to see. The Lord says, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because uh, the, the sin is what? Very grievous. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it. God says to Abraham, I've come to check things out. I've come to go through the place. I've come to deal with Sodom and Gomorrah. I've come to see what it is I need to see. I've come and God pauses long enough to stop by Abraham's house. God pauses long enough to stop by Abraham's crib. God pauses long enough to actually stop and have a conversation with Abraham. And, and I want you to understand, here it is. Abraham and God is talking. 
Abraham and God is talking, and Abraham asked the Lord. He says, Lord, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And, and, and the Lord says to Abraham, what are you talking about? And, and so Abraham throws out a number. He says, Lord, uh, if, if there are 50 folk that are righteous in the city, would you spare it? Watch this. Lord's eyes ran through in the place and couldn't find 50. And Abraham said, Lord, uh, how about 45? If there are 45 people, would you spare the city? And God says, for 45's sake, I'll spare it. His eyes run through, couldn't find 45. Abraham said, Lord, 40, 40, 40. If 40 are there, would you spare the city? God says, for 40. And he goes from 40 to 30. From 30 to 20. He goes from 20 to 10. And God says, if there are 10 righteous folk in that city, I will spare the entire city. That's your importance, folk. You are salt. The reason, and you are like the reason why stuff hadn't collapsed yet, because light and salt is still preserving and still keeping. But when salt has lost its sustaining power, it lights out. Ten. If they're ten. Think about this. If you read the rest of the thing when you get home, you'll find out that uh, Lot had two daughters that lived with him. Lot his wife, two daughters, that's four. But he actually had other daughters. I don't know if it's two or more. So even if you had two more, that's five, amen? No, yeah, yeah that's five, no, that's six. And then the sons, the son-in-laws, that's another two, that's eight. You mean to tell me you can find two more folk? You got eight up, up in your place, your, your family that you have in Sodom, there are a total of eight of y'all, and you can't witness, you couldn't witness a two more people in the entire city? You, you, you don't have ten folk? And God says, if I find ten, I'll spare the place. And I want you to understand, he looks and he looks and can't find 10. But I want you to know something very special. I'm so glad that even if they're not 10 folk, God is still looking at you. I'm so glad that even if they're not 50 folk or 25 folk or, or 30 folk or 40 folk, I'm so glad that when it comes down to it, God is interested in you. No matter what the number is, God is interested in you. He's interested in saving you. No matter at what cost, he's interested in saving you. And God will go as far as he needs to go. He'll do as much as he needs to do to save one person. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have a last life. And so after the, they leave Abraham's place in chapter 18, God goes back. The Lord goes back, but he sends two angels. And they come and they find Lot at the door. And Lot actually is very hospitable. He tells the man, he says, you got to turn into my place. And the man says, no, 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 no. We're going to stay out in the plaza. You read that. When they say we're going to stay out outdoors, they're talking about the plaza. We're going to stay here all night. And Lot says, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. You need to come in my house. And he begged them and he pleaded on them and he brought them in to the house and, and he fed them. He had a feast. And before they even went to go to close their eyes, there was a, a knock on the door. The Bible says the men of the city surrounded the house. And they said, Lot, Lot, come here, Lot, come on up, boy. I know you, you have some guys that came up tonight. We saw it, we saw it, we saw it. Come on, bring them out. We may know them. This is carnality. Lot came out. He says, no, no, no. Hey, sir, these folk are under my roof. Don't, 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 don't do that. And listen how crazy it is. How in the world 
Or are you going to say, I got two daughters who are virgins inside here who never knew a man. You could do with them. Or, what, you, anytime you picture your son tent towards Sodom, you're in trouble. You can't even think right. How in the world are you going to give up your own children? But you're all messed up. But he says, don't do that. Don't do that. He's willing to sacrifice his own children to save these guys. And when they began to press upon Lot and almost break the door down, the angel reached out the door, grabbed Lot, pulled him in, shut the door, smote them forward with blindness. And you know it gets rough when you're blind and you're still trying to do what you want to do. Can't see, but you're trying to still find the door. You can't see, but you're still trying to do your mess. You can't see, and God has stricken you with blindness. See, when the lights go off, it's time to go home. Tell somebody, say, when the lights go off, it's time to go home. Don't you turn off the lights, it's not time yet. But here it is. They're stricken with blindness. The angel said to Lot, do you have any family? around here. Go tell them. Go get them. It's time to leave the city. It's curtains for Sodom. It's curtains for Gomorrah. We're going to burn up the city. God has sent us on this mission. So Lot runs, runs out and talks to his girls and their husbands and the Bible says they laughed at him. Laughed at him. So he comes back and he's still delaying. And the angel says, it's time to get up out of here. You can't take no stuff with you. Grab your family. Time to get out. And a lot are still delaying. You know what the guys had to do? Angels had to grab Lot, grab his wife, grab his two daughters. And because God is merciful, it's because of God's mercy is why we're not consumed. His compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God grabbed the hold of Lot, his wife, his daughters, and the Bible says they pulled them out. How in the world are you going to be lost when God has brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees into a land? How in the world are you going to be lost when God blessed you to be fruitful? And in spite of the fact that, that you pitch your tent towards Sodom, how in the world are you going to be lost when God's got to grab you by your hand and pull you out? How in the world are you going to be lost after God has done all he could do? He pulls them out, gives one direction. He says, don't look back. Flee to the mountains. And Lot says, oh, I can't go that far. He says, there's a little place over here. Let me go to that place. Angel says, okay, we'll hold it off until you get there. And as they were entering that little city, that city was called insignificant. Fire and brimstone came down and burnt up the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sister Lot, look back. And the Bible says she became a pillar of salt. So if the salt has lost its savor, it is now good for nothing than to be thrown out and trodden under the foot of man. She looked around and forever she was frozen in time. An effigy of what God says he means. But above and beyond that, I looked at God's mercy and I looked at his grace and in spite of the fact that sometimes we are salt that has lost the ability, God still comes down to grab us. God still comes down to save us. 
God still comes down to give us a chance. Like the prodigal son, he still welcomes them back home. Like the lost coin, he searches for. Like the lost sheep, he goes looking for. I'm so glad that in spite of all of the doom and the gloom of this story, God came personally to give a chance and give an opportunity. You might have pitched your tent towards Sodom. You might feel like you're salt that has lost the ability to be salvaged. But I want you to understand that a God came down and spoke to Abraham. And a God sent his angels to go to Sodom when he couldn't find ten folk to find whosoever will. Come on, say amen. And I want you to know that's the God we serve. A God that says to us, I know you've pitched your tent in the wrong direction but I'm here to help you turn it around. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. You may not have been the right salt. You may not have even been the light that you need to be. You may have been caught up in worldliness and caught up in confusion. You may have had issues and you still are going through struggles and you know where you are spiritually with God. But I want you to know that God doesn't give up on us. He goes after us. He seeks us. He searches us out. And even if he had to put his hands on us to bring us out, to save us, God does that. That's why he came down from heaven, went up the rugged hill to a rugged cross, and was hung up between heaven and earth because God says, I'd rather die and give you an opportunity than spend eternity without you. God will go all the way to save us. And today you want to say, Brother Preacher, I heard the message. It's wrap-up time. Matthew, the 24th chapter, and Luke the 19th chapter talks about it. Wrap up time. Wrap up time. God is wrapping things up in such a way that you look right, left, and the center. Things are wrapping up so quickly. Like Noah's time, like Lot's time. It's almost curtains. But God has opened up a window. He's opened up an opportunity, and just like he spoke to Abraham and reached over to Sodom, caught Lot sitting in the gate, came to save him. You want to say, Brother Preacher, I'm available to let the Lord do what he needs to do in my life. You want to say, Brother Preacher, this day, I want to turn my destination from pitching my tent towards Sodom. I want my tent to be pitched towards God's program and God's kingdom. I want to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else will be added unto me. I want to commit myself to God. If that's your prayer, that's your commitment, wherever you are, stand right now. I want to stand and commit what I have to God. Praise God. I want to commit what I have to God. I want to commit what I have to God. Thank you for the hands. I want to commit what I have to God. And there may be some boy, some girl, some man, some woman who have not made Christ Lord of your life, but today you want to say, Brother Preacher, I heard the word. I know where I am spiritually, but I know where God wants me to be. And I'm not there yet. But today I'm willing to take the first step to walk in his way and walk in his will. If you've not given Christ the lordship of your life, what a Lord that will come down to rescue somebody from Sodom after they've made their own choice and grab us wherever we are. That's love, folks. That's mercy. That's grace. Who would not serve a God like that? Who would not love a God like that? Praise God. How you do what you do, God, 
we receive you today. Father, as we pray, we ask that you take every commitment, take every life molded, fashioned it according to your will. And thank you, God, that even when we have made bad and poor choices, you're still pursuing us. You're still running after us. You're still intervening on our behalf. God, you have no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. You're here to save us. Help us to be yielded to you. Thank you so much for sending a rescue team to salvage individuals from Sodom. God, you're doing the same in these last days. Help us that we may be fully yielded to your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 My prayer is today we'll determine even if our tents are pitched towards Sodom, to let God turn that thing around so that we'll be heading towards the, the new Jerusalem. Come on, say amen. Towards God's place. Amen. Let us give the man of God another amen. 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 Let us stand to be dismissed. Let us pray. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May the church of God say, Amen. Please be seated for a moment's meditation. you all. Now I know the Lord met us here this morning. He's in the presence of all of us. The devil's trying to throw a little monkey wrenches in the midst of this service. And he's not going to get the victory of what God has planned for this day. Because this is the Lord's holy Sabbath day. So let us continue to rejoice and be glad in it. Don't let Satan steal our joy. So let's rejoice. Let's